Good morning. My name is Jean Calvon. I was born in France in 1509. For my entire life, I was called Jean Calvon. But you probably call me John Calvin, <laughs> which is the English translation of my name. All those English. <laughs> I've come from 500 years in the past to speak with you on Reformation Sunday. Reformation, of course, refers to the Great Reformation. In Europe, when critics of the Roman Catholic Church split off and formed a new branch of Christianity, the Protestants. The base of the word Protestants is protest. And that is just what I and other rebels did. The Catholic Church of my day was corrupt and abusive. <coughs> Corrupt in terms of things like selling indulgences for the remission of sins. It embraced some doctrines that were not found in the Bible. In 1507, when I was only eight years old, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses on the churches in Wittenberg. Oh, what an uproar that caused. That was the beginning of a movement that led to the great schism in the church, the division of the church between Protestants and Christians. The Protestant movement then moved throughout Europe and then eventually the world, forming thousands of denominations and millions and millions of adherents. adherents. John Knox, the founder of Presbyterianism, stayed with me in Geneva for two years and then used that knowledge to return to Scotland and form the Presbyterian Church, an ancestor of Franklin Presbyterian Church. He's buried in there. Buried, is that correct? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm invited to be with you today. I wrote the first edition of my famous book, The Institutes of Christian Religion, in 1536, when I was only 26 years old. I revised and greatly expanded that book until my final edition in 1860 had over four volumes and 80 chapters. I also wrote a common, long commentaries on nearly every book in the Bible. And I wrote over 1,300 long letters that were published. As you can see, it was through this writing that I processed my ideas into theology. But given this gigantic body of work, I find it odd that it, I am known today mostly in terms of one thing, predestination. However, I consider a number of other doctrines much more important, or more important than predestination. Therefore, I want to briefly summarize some of my key parts of my theology before I turn to predestination in Cuba, which I have to do. First and foremost, God is sovereign. He's all-powerful and all-knowing. He's eternal, infinite, and unchanging. God is the total and total control of everything. <clears throat> Second, God is beyond human comprehension. We cannot begin to know Him or understand the ways and reasons of God beyond what He tells us in the Bible. Thus, we are incapable of judging God or His actions. Third, good is all, God is all good. He defines good. And he is the author of all goodness in the universe. God hates sin and evil, and he is worthy of our love and worship. Fourth, God is a trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Fifth, the Bible is God's perfect inerrant message to us. The Bible contains everything that God wants us to know about Him and about His relationship with us. It's only through the Bible that we can know God. Six, nothing can stand between us and God. We can read the Bible, worship God, and ask for forgiveness without going through the church, if they had to do it like that. And seventh, God demands that we love and nurture our fellow humans. Everyone contains the image of God to some extent. And that's what we we focus on in our relationships. There's so much more to talk about 
out of all these thousands of pages of writing. But I have time for just one more, what I'm known for, predestination. My writings were intensely debated by the followers and enemies of my theology long after I died. They reduced my thousands of pages of writing down to five points, which they claim were the essence of my theology. Tulum, an acrostic, was created as a memory device to remember the five points. Here are the five points. T, total depravity. All human beings are sinful, fall far short of the glory of God, and are totally unable to do anything to make them worthy of salvation. We are born sinful because of the sins of Adam and Eve that were passed down from generation to generation to every person. Thus, every person is born deserving of damnation. Second, you, T, now you, unconditional election. Even though no one is deserving of salvation, God, through his infinite grace and love, elected at the beginning of creation, the beginning of time, to save some people from eternal damnation. These people are called the elect. Because elect, God elected them for salvation and an eternity of bliss with God. All those other people, the unelect, will not be saved and will spend an eternity of damnation and sorrow. Absolute God. God's selection of the elect has nothing to do with what they did or who they are. He did it on his own free will. Three, L, T U L, limited atonement. God sent Jesus Christ to earth to die to atone for the sins of people. But only certain people <coughs> to select. Thus, the sacrificial atonement of, of Jesus' death was limited only to the elect. It was not for everyone. It was limited. Four, irresistible grace. The people chosen by God as his elect cannot resist his grace. The Holy Spirit graciously causes the elect sinner, and only the elect, to cooperate, to believe, to repent, to come freely and willingly to Christ. For the elect, God's grace is irresistible. You have no choice if you're an elect. In fifth, P, T U L I irresistible grace, P is perseverance of the saints. Once someone who is part of the elect has been saved by God's grace and Jesus' atonement, he or she will always be saved. There will be no backsliding by the, by the elect. The term double predestination is often used to describe the results of these tenets. That is, God predestines his elect to salvation and eternal life of bliss with God. But God also selects and predestines all others to an eternal life, to a damnation, and suffering in the absence of God. He elects those who are saved. He elects those who are not saved. What a person does throughout his life has absolutely no influence on whether or not he's saved. That is 100% God's action. You have nothing to do. Now I know this sounds shocking to so many of you to hear that this is many, much of the foundation of our Presbyterian Church. It doesn't sit well with the modern mind. It also didn't sit well with the 1500s mind. <laughs> it was shocking now, and it was shocking, shocking now, and shocking then. I wrote this 500 years ago. The human mind, when it hears this doctrine, cannot restrain this pestilence, but boils and rages as aroused by the sound of a trumpet. I also wrote this 500 years ago. Predestination is, a, is dreadful indeed, I confess. I don't like it, but it's the truth. It comes from God. I assure you that this predestination 
predestination, the doctrine of predestination, was not created by me. I found it by diligent study of the Bible and the works of the great St. Augustine. Augustine. How do I respond to the critics of predestination? I've got a whole bunch of responses to try and explain and help you understand why predestination has some very good things about it. I don't have time to go through all of them, but I'll mention just one. God is perfect. So God first, God is God. And we are totally incapable of understanding or judging God's actions. This is what the book of Job tells us clearly. We can't understand what God's up to. Judging God would be like an ant trying to judge and understand what we do. I'm just going to skip now, and as I look out on you, I sense that many of you remain unconvinced that predestination is the doctrine of God. Fine. If you feel that way, put it aside. What you feel about predestination has nothing to do with the truth of predestination. It has nothing to do with your salvation. Believe it, you should. But if not, put it aside. Don't fret about it. Don't worry about it. Instead, focus on those seven points I mentioned earlier. The real foundations of my belief about God and his relationship with you. There's so much more. But I want to close now by reading a few quotes from my writings 500 years ago to give you a broader sense of my theology. <coughs> there's not one blade of grass, there's no color in this world that is not intended to make us rejoice. Rejoice to God. True wisdom consists in two things, knowing God first and foremost and knowledge of yourself. Men are undoubtedly more in danger from prosperity than from adversity. For when matters go smoothly, they flatter themselves and are intoxicated by their success. We are not to reflect on the wickedness of men, but to look to the image of God in them. An image which covering and obliterating their faults, <coughs> an image which by its beauty and dignity shall lure us to love and embrace them. Focus on the image of God in every way. The happiness promised us in Christ does not consist in outward advantages such as leading a joyous and peaceful life, having rich possessions, being safe from all harm, and abounding with the life such as the flesh commonly longs for. No, our happiness belongs to the heavenly. I have one more quote here from 500 years ago, and I was wondering if I should read it. Then I said, what would Calvin do? <laughs> he would read it. When God wants to judge a nation, he gives them wicked rulers. God bless you. I hope I made it back to visit with you again. <laughs> <laughs>
chapter of Luke, and that beginning with the ninth verse, and we will find that on page uh, 14, 94 in your Bible. This is the parable of the Pharisees and the tax collectors. Uh, he's giving a comparison of the two kinds of prayers, and one enters in uh, with with his uh, pain and suffering while the other one uh, comes in spouting how great he is. He also told th this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself was praying thus, God, I thank you that I uh, that they, you that I am not like the other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, and even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give the tenth of all my income. But the tax collector standing far off would not even look up to heaven, but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me. A sinner. I tell you that this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, when Don and our and our young family lived in southern Illinois, uh, uh, back seems like many years ago, uh, there was a television program that came on every afternoon about the time the children got off the school bus. And it was about a clown who had an a, a entertainment message, but a real message for the children. He had this little red ball that was a little bigger than a golf ball, and he'd hold that red ball up, and he said, keep your eye on the ball. And the reason he says keep your eye on the ball, he had a sleight of hand movement that he would make that the kids were always trying to get what it was that he was doing. Keep your eye on the ball. Let's look at the Pharisee. Now, all the Pharisees, it always seemed that they could not keep their eye on the ball. Thus, they could not keep their mind on what the main thing was in their life, the main thing being their worship of God and coming with not the exalted uh, bragging, but the sense of coming before God asking for grace. The Pharisee is such an easy target for Jesus and our critique. Boy, can we get into this in Bible studies about this, the evil coming out of the Pharisee. And, and uh, we see that the Pharisee was the best that the community had to offer. And we find that the Pharisee was one who was really good at keeping all of the tenets of the Torah, the Old Testament that they had. He not only fasts when it says to fast, but he doubles his experience of practicing the rituals in the temple life. And when he is asked to give, he gives double. He is really the best that the community has to offer. He has failed to see that he has gotten his eyes and his heart off of the ball that Jesus is attempting to get his, his sight back onto and that to be able to recognize that there was a God that was, uh, that was above all that he knew in his life. Then there was the tax collector. He is likely a Jewish man working for the Roman government. He's living pretty well. And yet he's, he's taking a little extra off the top for himself. In other words, he charges more tax than it was necessary. And he must know that he has also lost track of who it is and who is king in his life. Only his heart has been burning and hurting for the love of God that he seems to have lost. And he knows it. He knows that he needs to have a total spiritual makeover. And he comes and prays in such a way that, as Jesus is telling us, he got it. There's a lesson to be learned by all children and adults of today about keeping our eye on the ball. Keeping the main thing the main thing. 
because we too will drift from side to side. We, we need to be able to recognize it was not just the Pharisees to which the scripture is speaking. It's for those early Christians and the Christians coming down through the ages. So remember, just because we are quite religious or we got there first doesn't make us more powerful in, in a congregation. Does not necessarily mean that we have the message that is further and foremost down the line, above and beyond those who might come in lately. We, are the, we, we who are the believers can take our eye off the ball if we're not careful. And, and we miss the point of who is really in charge in life. We're vulnerable to be falling victim then to the pride and self-righteousness that is brought into life. Now, to, uh, so today's lesson then gives us two sides of the human predicament. One of my professors used to talk about the human predicament quite a lot and it, it was drilled into us that as John Calvin said uh, we fall far short and, uh, and we need to get back into the world. We need to recognize how it is to live in the temptations of life that we live in. The world that keeps attempting to lure us off to one side. When we are failing to recognize that we live with limited resources in this world, we need to return to be good stewards of what it is that we have had brought uh, to us. I remember as a very young child, my parents were always out after a big storm that washed in the soil, putting rocks and little cedar brushes into the little area and put, put the cedar down and then I put some rocks on it so it wouldn't blow away. And then maybe you would throw some dirt in on top of it too, that you might preserve the soil. So we need to be able to think what it means to be humble in the presence of Christ, in the presence of, of God. So what are the further lessons that we uh, are to learn in today's gospel then? Well, first is God can do little if the person has already decided in his or her mind that, that they are right, and nobody, can, including God, can change their mind about how things ought to be. The way of the Pharisee can be ours or not. Somehow, in the middle of the night, this, uh, uh, last night came an old country music song. And, and it goes this way. It's hard to be humble when you are perfect in every way. Anybody remember that one? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> It's the exact opposite of where we want to be. He said, I can't wait to look in the mirror. Oh boy, God's got a surprise for you, doesn't he? So anyway, um, when we look at it, we see that we need to live in such a way that we can live to look into the mirror. There was another poem written by the man in the mirror, a very uh, uh, good one for us to remember. So it is... We live in such a way that we can count that we can can account ourselves as being one who has not only obeyed scripture but who has gone out and made scripture come alive in the presence of other people. When we fail to recognize the call to live out the demands of Christ, we too may be missing the mark. How many ways have you and I thought judgmentally just yesterday, maybe even a few minutes ago? We allow our judgments about people and events and circumstances to go through our mind quite frequently. Um, when I was a youngster, they, we were trying to break bad habits. They'd say, well, uh, put a rubber band on your wrist and every time you think that would, uh, or you, you're tempted, what? Snap, snap it. So maybe we need that as part of, uh, of the prop to go with our prayers when we are asking for God's grace. Two, when we have judged that we are right for the position for which we have taken, we need to consult God on how we might be able to continue listening to what other people have to say and then hear maybe God's message coming even from the least of these. A child, a baby, or someone that we would have never thought that was so taken by trying to get a sense of who God has called him to be. So in a world that is perfect, as we see, 
It makes sense that we step in and do God's work by judging. That's in the perfect world that we've created. Our eyes and hearts become fixed on the goal for which we have already set. Back when I was a youngster, they used to say that uh, the way to hit a perfect bullseye was to go up and, uh, and shoot onto the barn wall and then draw the bullseye around it. <laughs> we still want to try to do that sort of thing in life at times. Do we see God in our vision for seeking God's real call for us? That's the question. The third is God answers the prayers of the truly humble person. Our goal is to find humility in all that we do. Oh, it's so nice when people say good things about us and we can say thank you and we can smile to know that we're all on track with one another and that maybe we just did the good and the right thing. The question is, can we keep producing that good and right thing and do it in such a humility. God notices all of our prayers, but God can do more with the answers and parts for prayers that come from the humble heart. If there is one gift that comes with age, it is the prospect of the experience of pain and disappointment that can bring us to an humbleness of heart. I, I don't like the thoughts that, that the only way we're going to learn humility is going through pain and suffering. But if we'll lift ourselves above that pain and that suffering, maybe we just find God's Spirit giving us grace to see things a little differently than we have. I have a book that I bought several years ago. It's called To See Differently. It's to see in the darkness of all the things that hurt us terribly and to see daylight, a silver lining around the cloud that draws us back to the maker and the creator of life. So life is like water flowing uh, over jagged rocks. If you go to the Smoky Mountains, it's a great place to see rocks with smooth, rounded uh, uh, edges on it. It's almost like some of them get almost round <clears throat> and oblong, but they're, but they're very smooth all the way around. So to the children, how did the rocks get so smooth? The water ran over them for thousands and thousands of years. Thousands of years. And uh, that's something like what happens uh, to us as well. I, uh, I learned a few years ago of a mule trainer that uh, uh, helped uh, the mules not to be so jittery when they wanted to ride them through the forest. A breaking a twig would cause this particular mule to jump. I'm not saying I advocate this. But it worked. They put a billy goat in the stall with the mule, which aggravated the mule all the time. So the mule grew used to the fact that you just have to go and eat your oats and your hay and let Billy rub his horns on your belly all he wants to. Every life's going to be just fine. So we have those opportunities <clears throat> to learn from those. So uh, interesting, when I was young, a, a young teenager and then a young adult, I never met a pastor's family that did not have a perfect family. The pastor was perfect. He wore a dark suit and a white shirt and a tie to work every day. Uh, his family did no wrong. Everybody was polished and everything was great. I went to a seminary and I found a lot of imperfect people there. People had gone through all kinds of circumstances in their lives. And maybe they had done some things, too, that they would not ever want to do again. And they had prayed with their heads down and with an humble spirit. And God called them to ministry. I've watched some of the people, when I was there, I was surprised that they were there. I was so naive. I've watched them through the years. They've accomplished so much for the kingdom of God. I want to bring a couple of names for some of you who are older. And if you're younger here today, you say, who are they? In the 19, middle 70s, there was a person by the name of um, uh, Jeb Stuart Magruder. Anybody know where he came from? Jeb Stuart Magruder. Jeb Stuart. Yes, Jeb Stuart Magruder. He became a Presbyterian pastor in a church in Lexington, one of the bigger churches, after going to seminary. 
He was part of the Watergate, Watergate scandal. Chuck Colson, you know his name? Any of you who have been around uh, prison ministries? He was known as the dirty tricks man for the uh, president during those days. He died in, in, in when he was 90, when he was uh, 80 years old. And when he died, they said, this is a man of great compassion, created great service to humanity, and was an advocate and a champion for those who were in prison. They forgot what it was that he was doing as a dirty trickster. The grace of God levels all of our lives one way or another if we would become a part of listening to what God has. Broken lives, yours and mine, everybody that we know who has come and found that grace uh, comes down to great ways where what has been perfect inside us has now come to bear fruit no matter what. Uh, do we come with contrite hearts and prayer? That is the question for us. Do we finally settle down and settle into the call that Christ has? Do we encourage each other by sharing our stories of faith, the stories of pain and suffering that brought us to a new way of looking and living and find encouragement to alter and to, to alter our experience and all of us go to the altar together. Amen. Thinking about when I was a youngster, they put the rubber band on our, our wrist to snap it when we recognized we were falling short on some habit or something. Maybe we have a, a mental uh, rubber band we can snap every time we find ourselves not being quite uh, the person of humility that uh, we might feel that we are, wish that we are. Let us go in the peace of Christ that goes with us wherever we are and guides us, directs us, that we might find the work of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen.